we're ready to start. Okay, um, allow me to introduce uh, Andrea Zollner. Andrea is the Chief Content Creator at SiteGround, and their one and only Canadian employee. She lives in Montreal, where she's where speaking both English, a highly efficient language, and French, an impossibly poetic one, shape her approach to copywriting and strategic brand messaging for an international audience. When she's not writing content about WordPress and hosting, she's updating her travel blog. Uh, the travel blog is called The Capsule Suitcase, and she hopes one day to have a hobby that doesn't involve websites. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Zollner. Times, when the New York Times 
released this really awesome multimedia piece called Snowfall. And, you know, I was a plucky journalism student then, and it just seemed really exciting that we could take in-depth reporting and turn it into a micro site like this that walked you through like the how, the why, the who of the stories. The New York Times um, had done this really in-depth reporting on an avalanche, a really deadly avalanche. And they integrated all of these maps and these um, interactive videos and these storytelling elements that um, really changed the way that a lot of people thought about storytelling online. It opened up all these new ways of presenting people and facts and encouraging people to really um, engage with content in a new way. In fact, after it was released, I think within six days, it had 3.5 million uh, page views, 2.9 million visitors, uh, nearly a third of whom had never visited the Times website before. So for an industry that was like on the decline, journalism and, and you know, news, having a third of your visitors be newcomers to your website was kind of a big coup. And a lot of, a lot of newsrooms were then catching on to this trend, um, putting out their own versions of this. And so that's when we started having things like, are we going to snowfall this story? Or when are we going to do a snowfall? Uh, I mean, in fact, it won like a Pulitzer Prize and a Peabody Award, and a lot of people say it, it's quoted to have changed digital media and news reporting forever. So I did a bit of research about the technical specs of Snowfall, and of course, a lot of it is jQuery. Um, back in 2012, you know, the team that developed this said that they used some modal slideshows that they've already used for other projects, um, underscore, jplayer, they use HTML5 video, jQuery, real, and address, and some trigger scroll-based events that they uh, took inspiration from, from a jQuery plugin. So I'll just scroll through this a little bit quicker. But yeah, so with Gutenberg, I want to say that anyone can snowfall. Um, now that we have all these tools built in right into WordPress, it's a lot easier for just the ordinary person to integrate all these uh, videos and images and to really bring your content to life uh, without having a, a newsroom full of professional digital content creators and designers. So I think it's really exciting. It's a really exciting time and I'm going to walk you through some of the features that you can use in Gutenberg to do something similar to Snowfall or adapt it to whatever it is you're doing. Whether you're a blogger, whether you run your own business website, um, or whether you are working for an agency, all of these tools can be applied to your content. So let's take a look at Gutenberg um, just from the get-go. So if you take a look at the right-hand bar there, you have your document toolbar, and a lot of that is going to be super similar to the stuff that you've seen in the current editor. So you know you have your status, the visibility, the publish date, um, all of those uh, settings that you need to set for your page or your post before you publish. You know, you have your, your featured image and your discussion and sharing, all of that that's already built in. But you also have the block tab. And the block tab comes alive because Gutenberg is designed around these block elements. So if you hover over the main text area, you'll see a little plus button, and you can start adding these blocks, and a, a menu will appear that you can search. And I got pretty good at searching because I know there's so many options that I kind of like developed my own favorite ones, and so those most used ones come to the top, and really other ones you can just search them by keyword. So when you add a block, all of a sudden the block um, toolbar on the side pops up, and you can control each individual block, whether it's a text, an image, a short code, all of the different blocks that are available have their own set of, um, of handles and, and controls that you can use. So that's a really exciting way that you can start thinking and laying out your content because you're going to be able to fine tune and control every single one of those pieces. Keep in mind that because a lot of this um, depends, not a lot, but some of it does depend on your theme, you may have some blocks appear that other um, websites that you manage don't have. So for example, I have Yoast SEO built into, or in, I have it installed on one of my websites. And so in Gutenberg, I have a couple of blocks that are generated by Yoast, which are some structured data uh, blocks. So depending on what plugins you have and how your theme is designed, you may have a couple of different options or a couple of less options. But generally speaking, these are some of the main blocks. Um, and I've put them into a couple of categories, like text styling, media, um, quotes has its own, because there are a lot of different options on how to manage quotes, uh, layout, and your classic code blocks. 
So these are a lot of the options that you can use to start designing your own uh, snowfalls. So let's get right into it. Because this is the bulk of the presentation, right? You want to know, okay, um, here are all these options, but is it really that important to me or is it really that useful to me? I just want to get some text on a page. Uh, but really what I hope to accomplish today is to inspire you, to show you, if you were scared about Gutenberg at first, just to show you quickly how to use the tools that's available to you and what you can do to implement it into your workflows. So the first tip that I have is use Gutenberg to add style to your text. This one kind of seems like a no-brainer. Um, everyone wants to add a little bit of style to their text. I mean, for a long time we had options like italics and underscore underlines and bold, and you could uh, control your headings, you could change the colors, and if you wanted to get into CSS, you could do a lot more than that. Um, but now you can sort of do it without having to go outside of the main editor, and you can add a lot of different interesting elements that will stylize your text. So whether that's just your basic paragraph that you want to work with, a pull quote, now you can actually use columns in Gutenberg, which is super awesome. You don't have to like hand quote that or anything, or depend on your theme to provide that kind of styling. You can go ahead and add columns of text yourself. You can stylize your verses, your quotes. You can add like really um, advanced lists, and you can control the headings that you use in your subheaders. Because one of the things that I like to recommend to people is don't just dump text on a page. No one wants to engage with that. It's really scary to have a long, long bit of text, um, but it's a lot easier to engage with if you have spacing, if you have diversity in the type of uh, text layout that you have. And so those visual breaks also allow for a hierarchy of information. And by using pull quotes, you can also decide what salient quotes people are going to re uh, retain from your content and what they're going to do, uh, what they're going to remember when they leave the page. So in Gutenberg, Again, everything is built like a puck. So here we have some text elements, and I just sort of dumped a bunch of them on the page. Um, but, well, it's supposed to be playing for you. But you can see pretty much what's on the page here. You have a couple of columns and, um, and some pull quotes. And, yeah, see, this is just like a diverse grouping of headings. And so there's a lot of possibilities by diversifying your text. You can do a drop cap. Um, the columns, like I said, and some really neat pull quotes just to diversify what's available to you. Andrew, what is a verse? In your last slide, we had verse. Yeah, so a verse would be probably a quote from a book or from some other source that you want to stylize a little bit differently, um, something that breaks apart from your regular, from your regular text. The next one is images. This one's also kind of a no-brainer. When we think about what's on our page, we have text and we have images. Uh, now in Gutenberg, we have a lot more options for our images. So whether you want to do like a full screen of images with a couple of different galleries, uh, before we just had to rely on a couple of preset gallery styles, unless you went and installed a bunch of plugins to get exactly the look that you want. Uh, and then things like, you know, right justified images with text, all of that would take a lot longer to design and you wouldn't always get the result that you want when you looked at a tablet or a phone either. So it got kind of complicated for just the average user to really put what they had in their mind onto the page. So with Gutenberg you can have, you know, just images but you have a lot more options on how to style them. Some gallery options, cover image which is a really cool tool that you can use to add an image, add um, a color overlay, and add text right onto the image without having to use a third party thing like Canva or um, one of the tools you have on your computer. So, and then you can also, we have a lot of options for embeds. So if you just want to go pull something from Instagram, pull something from Flickr, you can do it right in your editor and you can just copy and paste directly in, and it'll generate um, just like that. So that just adds a really nice element uh, to, to storytelling and to adding images. And I also have a screenshot of something that kind of looks like a service block. Yeah, I have a question here. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just, uh, if you pull something from Instagram and it's a little video, will it just autoplay? I believe you still have to click on it. Okay. Yeah, but I would test it out, like anything. So I have a screenshot here of, you know, these four blocks because one of the cool things that people do with galleries is use them to design these buttons, you know, a lot of people want to create websites that have very visually striking um, ways to interact with links 
And uh, if you want to have like a display of different services, but you don't want it to just be boring text links, you can use a gallery to then add hyperlinks and create like a really tidy, neat way of displaying your services or um, maybe link to other blog posts that you've categorized. And however you decide to do it, you, know, you can use the gallery now to do it really easily and seamlessly. And so number three is to integrate other types of host types. So that sounds like a really boring point, but playing with Gutenberg, I realized that when people engage with your content, oftentimes you as an author, you want them to stay on your website by sending them somewhere else. So whether it's related content to that specific blog post, or whether there's an action that you want them to take after engaging with your content, like signing up, uh, registering for an event, or downloading an ebook, or whether, you know, going to a, an e-commerce store that you have related to your, your website. All of these actions are things that you want people to do right after they engage with your content, not later. You, know, you want them to stay on your website as much as possible. And what Gutenberg does is make it super easy to pull all of that content into one page, and then you can design an experience for your customers or for your readers. When they come onto your website, they can read your text, but you know, if you want them to continue reading, you can then pull all of the related content and display it using short codes, which we were able to do before, but now it's a little bit more intuitive. And to also show different content in the same category, you can also display archives, you can lay show related posts, <coughs> latest posts, and you can also add files. So if you are sharing information about an event and you want people to download a registration form or you want people to download an ebook or some guidelines, anything that's sort of a PDF document or something like that, you don't have to send them into another part of the website or you don't have to link um, in a very you know, boring way. You can actually start building these pages that have a little bit more interest. So this is like a snapshot of the editor side. So here what I've done is I've just used a short code to show portfolio uh, entries because that's another type of content. So we have our post types like posts, but we also have the basic ones like portfolio and testimonials, which we can use short codes to control. Uh, and so by using short codes, we can display them. We can choose if we have the thumbnail or not. We can put them into columns. And then around that, using some of the Gutenberg blocks, we can also add content that we've stylized to then support those, um, those short codes that we've created. So whether we want to get people to engage in a certain way, we can create call to actions or uh, recommendations. And we can also create these really neat buttons that then link to other parts of our website uh, in, a, in a very engaging way and, and a very encouraging way. So, you know, on the front end, it kind of looks like this. Like, I have two posts that I went and generated with my short code, and then I have a link to more articles, and then I have a link to a file. So this is just a very rudimentary example of how you can start building landing pages that do exactly what you want to do, you know, have exactly the content that you want to put together for the experience that you're trying to create for your readers. Um, and so that's just another way of using the Gutenberg blocks to really um, define different experiences for your customers and not have to use a bunch of plugins to do it. Number four is to add multimedia. Again, storytelling, a lot of it is visual. So if, like in the Snowfall example, using maps that are interactive and GIFs, well, somewhat interactive, at least maps that show things, GIFs, videos, all these things that add a little bit of interest to your content. Uh, now with Gutenberg, you can just do it by adding a blog. And so, I mean, these are just the basic ones, audio and, and video, but if you type in video into the Gutenberg block selector, you'll also have options to embed from YouTube. Uh, for, video, for audio, you can embed from Spotify and all sorts of other third-party services. And so, you know, in a page, you can end up having a really diverse and interesting, uh, interesting experience because you've gotten pulled content from different sources and you've crafted exactly the content that you'd like to present. So different media services are, are added, being added to the list all the time. Uh, so it kind of just looks like this in the editor. Once you embed an image, or sorry, a video or an audio, you also have a whole bunch of different controls that appear. And so on the side, you have you know, autoplay and loop, and you know, someone asked a question about like, Instagram. I'm not sure about that, but I do know for uploads that are directly from your WordPress installation, you do have the ability to control how that video is going to play. So if someone's scrolling down your page and you want a video to autoplay, then you can control that experience. 
Now, another way that Gutenberg has made it easier for people to create exactly the kinds of pages that they want is that they have some tools to add breathing room. And I think people underestimate the importance of white space when you're designing a page or when you're a content creator because you want your page to breathe and you want to have room for people to digest the content and you want them to understand the flow of what you're presenting. And you know, a lot of the times before, we would just have to do hard returns or go into HTML and add non-breaking spaces. Or, and then those would never save, or there'd always be a problem when we were trying to, to edit the content, and they wouldn't save our layout. And these were just some of the headaches that we'd have as, as room entry users. And now, with Gutenberg, you know, those are built in. So you can create columns, which allow you to organize your text in different ways. You can add tables without having to hand code them, and they're responsive. You can you know, create different ways of managing your content that allow your reader to, to not be overwhelmed and to have it breathe. You can have pagination, or, you, know, you can have page breaks, so people can, uh, you can split up your content in a way that, is, that makes sense. You, know, you, have different, you have different themes, people can go through the pages separately. And you can also have spacers, which is just another non-breaking space, you know, an extra space that you don't have to hand code yourself. Um, the more tag and the separator tag so these are all ways to add space to your content um, that you know, will make it a little bit more enjoyable for people to engage with it. And the last, or not the last one, but the second to last one is to build in a call to action. Um, I think people think of call to actions as an orange button that says buy now. But even, right, but even, um, even just your typical blog uses like the call to action idea in different ways. So when you ask people to continue reading, that's sort of a call to action. When you ask them to subscribe or to check out your related articles, um, you know, these are all the ways you want people to engage with your website and to, to, make, to make a decision to keep engaging with it. So call to actions with Gutenberg, of course we have our button block, which is a super cool tool that you can use. Um, I think my videos are going to play, but uh, we do have like, the button block, which is a really neat way that you can just choose a button and choose the color, choose how it's designed, and all of that is just going to be seamlessly done right in Gutenberg. You don't have to get the CSS like one used to have to. You don't have to copy it um, and find the color exactly that you're looking for through the hex code. You can just go ahead and build your, your button, and it'll save right in your content, and that's one of the ways that you can. Um, there we go. Yeah, so that's how you add a button. Is it blurry on that screen or is that just me? Very small. Very small, yeah. Anyway, all my slides are going to be available, so you can take a look at these videos. I will um, tweet out a link later today so you can check out all the demo videos that I had in this presentation. And so you can start playing around with it yourself. So this is just me. Um, one of the cool things that Gutenberg does also is they show you an accessibility uh, hack. So if your color combination is not very legible, it'll give you a warning sign. So if you're trying to do like black on dark brown and say this is impossible to read, please fix it. You can, uh, yeah, which is helpful. Um, you can set your different like the different button types, and that's just an easy way. Like I use that all the time, whether it's read more or um, you know, sometimes on my travel blog, I'll link to other things, and I'll, I'll use a button because it just makes it a little bit more friendly. But there's other tools in Gutenberg that you can use to evoke a similar, like, call to action. Uh, yeah, so you can use a pull quote. If that's something that you want to do to draw attention to a certain action or draw attention to an idea, you can use a pull quote, and it doesn't have to be a quote. You can use it to, uh, to say something encouraging, like to donate today. And also, you can control the color, like I said. The other thing is to use an image. So instead of having to design your image outside of Gutenberg, like with Canva or something, you can just build it right into Gutenberg. So you pick your image from your media library, you upload something new, and with the tools, you can then add uh, color over it, you can add text over it, and then all of a sudden, it becomes this really neat, self-contained little call to action button that, um, that you can reuse on other parts of your website as well. And speaking of reusing your blocks, that's one of the really awesome things about Gutenberg is that if you've spent all this time designing a cool call to action you know, block like we just saw, then you can save it 
and it will be saved into your favorites forever. And you can use it on your different pages, on your different blog posts, and it will always have a consistent look. And that's especially useful if you have a multi-author blog where you're managing a website where there are multiple people contributing. You can go ahead and ask your design team to design some blocks that follow your branding guidelines, and they'll be saved into your favorites. And then whoever uses that website can then go into your Gutenberg blocks. You can name it something separate, and they'll be able to reuse that block, whether it's like a call to action or if it's something with a short code that links to other types of content on your website. Again, all of these blocks, you can save, custom label them, and then you can reuse them from page to page. This is just an example, a pretty stupid example of a purple block, but um, the idea is there. It's just that you custom labeled it yourself, and it's going to be there for you to, um, to reuse from time to time. So, I've blown through that really quickly. That means that we're going to have loads of time for questions. But in summary, what I'll say about Google is that use it to stylize your text, to add images, to maximize the post types that you have in your blog or on your website, to add audio and video and to make it dynamic with more multimedia, to add white space so you can make things breathe a little, add a call to action, whether that's like a direct action or um, with a link or an idea. And you can also create these reusable blocks so that your website is always consistent and seamlessly in line with your branding guidelines. That's it. Thank you. Okay, remember to uh, follow Andrea at uh, her handle there. Andrea is on there on Twitter. She'll be tweeting out um, the videos from her presentation. You can also go to the WordCamp website and go to Schedule, uh, and you'll see all the slides for all the presenters. So who has a question? Mine actually isn't a question. I just wanted to say for anyone who hasn't seen Snowfall, what that is about is the huge avalanche that took out, um, it was in, the, in Snoqualmie. So it's about a local uh, thing from 10 years ago. It's, total, it's still up on the web and it's totally worth watching. Um, so, so what's the experience like if, you know, if, if I or one of my clients is used to typing paragraph and being return and typing another paragraph and being return, does Gutenberg disrupt that flow and, and force you to create a new paragraph every time you want to type a new traditional paragraph? No. So you have the option to add a block that's a paragraph. And within that block, you could have a very similar experience to what you had before. There's also the classic block, which also does the same thing. So if you add a classic text uh, block, then you'll have a similar experience, but it'll be within the block structure. But then if you decide you want to put, uh, sorry, if you decide you want to put an image inside of one of those, then is it easy enough to split them up? Um, then it is easy to split them up because you have the option to change regular, um, or if you are opening up something that was designed maybe in the original editor, you have the option if you click on it to turn it into a block. Okay. So then if you decided after you've written this long text that you wanted to create separate blocks for you to add images in between, you do have that option. Yeah. Okay. It'll be an interesting time. It will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? So you said that um, it uh, allows you the ability to save like buttons or different blocks that you've created. Um, are those available for anyone that logs in, or is that just for your login? I believe that they're available for anyone who logs in who has certain level of permission. So I think if they're an author and above, uh, they're allowed to use it. But I think that would also depend on how you set up your permissions and your access. I would play around with it, but my experience so far has been that if it's saved in, the, in, in your WordPress installation, anyone who's an author should be able to access them. OK. Anybody else? Kind of related to that question, um, <clears throat> the a lot of all those choices remind me of the old. I'm old enough to remember the introduction of uh, desktop publishing and the ensuing amateurish layouts and color selection, things like that. Are there sort of admin controls that um, give different levels of uh, design, uh, access to these tools to different users? 
I don't know. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think people have come up with all these case studies yet. But I think that is a great question because I, you know, I had a similar experience when I was using something like Keynote, for example, for the Mac users. Keynote, another version of PowerPoint, they had all these different templates that were available, and I thought, great, people in my in my class, you know, are going to have these beautiful slides all of a sudden. You know, they have these templates. How could you go wrong? And then I get to class, and everyone is using one different theme per slide. So they would have these, these Frankenstein presentations until all the options ended up making it worse. Um, but I think that there's probably going to be either some development in core or some plugin that's going to allow people to just lock down those options. I don't know that it exists yet, but I'm sure it's coming because that's going to happen. Okay. Let's start here. <coughs> Hi, um, I was just curious if there were any specific um, tools in Gutenberg for integrating maps into like blog posts and things like that. Well, um, we have the classic HTML block. So anything that's coded in HTML, you can easily just embed right in there. Um, I think a lot of, again, it's so early that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of plugin developers that are probably going to be playing around with adapting whatever their plugin does to block formats for Gutenberg. So if there are some tools out there that already exist for map integrations, for example, um, it may not be very long before that's designed for Gutenberg. And where that becomes a block right in Gutenberg, where you can embed from third party um, map creators, you know, whether it's, well, with Google, again, you can use HTML, but there might be some other more advanced map technologies and map third party services um, that you know, are a little bit trickier to handle. But I'd say right now, HTML is probably the easiest block if you're using anything outside of the Gutenberg realm. Okay, plenty of time. Any other questions? <laughs>